We are talking today to uh, Charlotte Jacobs, the author of Jonas Salk, A Life. Welcome to the listeners and readers of Redera. Good morning. Good morning. You have a fascinating book, and you cover in your book a fascinating character and also a very challenging uh, uh, disease that uh, the world was facing at that time. Would you describe what the book is all about? Thank you. Well, it's a biography, so of course it's a life story of Jonas Salk, who was probably one of history's most famed physician scientists. He's probably best known for his polio vaccine. So let me just set a little bit of the stage for that. In 1916, the United States had its first polio epidemic in which 27,000 people were afflicted. Many died, and many of those who survived spent the rest of their lives in iron lungs, in wheelchairs, or on crutches. And every summer after that, uh, the number of polio cases escalated uh, in this country. And to make matters worse, no one could predict which town or which child would be the crippler's next victim. It was predominantly a disease that affected children. So swimming pools and movie theaters were closed, and parents were very vigilant, but there was very little they could do to protect their children because polio was highly contagious. And when a child was infected, there was really no effective treatment. So fear really pervaded our country. Then on April 12, 1955, when the world learned that Jonas Salk's uh, vaccine could prevent polio, a, a celebration erupted worldwide, and really overnight he became a hero. He, he was born in, uh, in uh, East Harlem. Uh, he was humble in manner, and uh, he really had uh, what I call all the makings of a, of a 20th century icon. But in the in the wake of this enormous uh, celebration, it, he just received thousands and thousands of gifts from the public. He had awards from heads of states around the world. Um, his name was ranked with Gandhi and Churchill and Roosevelt on, on lists of revered people for years. Yet he was ostracized by the scientific community, and that was the one group whose adulation he, he sought. His historical role in, in preventing polio actually has overshadowed his numerous other accomplishments. Not many people know he co-developed the first influenza vaccine. He uh, constructed the magnificent uh, Salk Institute, which we can talk about later, in San Diego, and did pioneering work on multiple sclerosis and on the AIDS vaccine. But in every one of his efforts, this kind of mild-mannered uh, scientists seemed to be pitted against the scientific community and they were all of his efforts had kind of had all these backroom scientific politics going on with the health of the public on stake. Uh, Salk was driven, a driven scientist and so his work pretty much defined him leaving little time for his family and he had uh, a number of, of personal difficulties which I uh, cover in the book. But in the end, it is it is a biography, and I set out to try to understand, uh, was he really an American saint, which most of the public uh, thought, or was he a self-absorbed man who connived to assure himself a place in medical history, uh, which was how many of the scientists felt about him. Biographies are very popular, and I think they're very popular because readers want to witness someone else's journey through life, particularly uh, their heroes and uh, how that person developed, what drove him or her, their path, their triumphs, their struggles. I think Longfellow uh, said it best in his uh, famous uh, poem when he said, uh, lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. So I think if biography helps people understand lives of those unlike their own, or change their own lives, then it really has served kind of a higher purpose. Mm -hmm. Saul, as you say, was a driven man, and uh, he had a difficult, uh, what was his early life, kind of? Uh, how did he get interested in, uh, or why he was good at the scientific discoveries, and or dealing with the big issues of the day? So he was born in 1914. He was born, in, as I said, in East Harlem. Uh, into a uh, Russian-Jewish 
immigrant family that lived in a tenement. Um, but his mother uh, told him uh, when he was young that he had been born with a call, and that's part of the amniotic membrane that covers the face at birth. It's very uncommon. And that that meant that he was destined for greatness. That seemed pretty unlikely because he was fairly shy, uh, submissive, small boy who just was more comfortable with books than uh, with people. But he believed her. And uh, he used to pray on a regular basis that someday he would perform some noble deed. Uh, so he went through the typical uh, city schools in uh, New York. Uh, they had no money, but he was able to go to city college and uh, uh, and on to medical school and, and did fairly well. Uh, but he was working on, uh, he co-developed, as I mentioned, uh, a, uh, the first influenza vaccine. He was only 33 years old, uh, interestingly. So he was a physician, but didn't practice. He was more interested in, in doing research, which was pretty uncommon at the time. And so he was working toward making what he called a universal vaccine, a vaccine that would cover all the different strains of the influenza virus. And uh, he was pretty much blocked in every move he made by the more senior people in the field of influenza. So when the director of what was called the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, or later referred to as the March of Dimes, asked him to join them in their effort to uh, prevent polio, he readily agreed. He'd kind of gotten a little uh, fed up with the uh, influenza field. And the uh, March of Dimes was led by a very powerful man named Basil O'Connor. This was a big national public effort, amazing, uh, to stop polio. And he joined that effort as the most junior member of the scientific team. <laughs> and um, would you be able to describe more of what were the milestones he was able to achieve in discovering the vaccine that others failed to see that he was able to find? Yes. So uh, one of the things I spend a lot of time in in the book, because I think it's important, is to give a sense of what the scientific world uh, was like back then. A lot of it hasn't changed. but uh, And there was a pecking order among scientists, polio scientists. And as I said, he was clearly the junior person. And uh, so one of the first tasks that they had to find in order to um, – make a vaccine was how many different strains there were. Were there one? Were there a hundred? They had to know because they had to include them all in the vaccine. And so he, he volunteered to undertake that project, which was a fairly mundane project that none of the senior scientists wanted wanted to do. And, and he did find that there were three strains. As he was doing his work, he had a major point of um, disagreement with all the other polio scientists. And that is that they all felt that in order for a vaccine to be effective, you had to have a live virus, a live polio virus that was weakened, uh, because that had been the case with the two other major vaccines at that time, yellow fever and smallpox. And Jonas Salk really believed that you could kill a virus and put it in a vaccine, and it would still generate immunity and be effective. But Jonas was a, a pretty retiring person. He did not like conflict. Uh, so he didn't really express his ideas to the rest of the um, polio scientists. Uh, he was at the University of Pittsburgh at that time, and they all wanted to go in a very particular order, uh, as scientists will, in making a vaccine. They had a number of steps, and they assigned different projects to uh, different scientists. Well, <laughs> so saw every summer thousands and thousands of people dying and crippled, and he really wanted to move ahead with his vaccine. But he didn't tell any of them. He only told Basil O'Connor, this powerful director of the March of Dimes, who kind of gave him his blessing. And the amazing thing is that Salk and his small laboratory group, not some large pharmaceutical house, made that first killed virus polio vaccine in just three months. That's, that's amazing. The second thing he did was he tested it in secret at the Watson Home for Crippled Children. Now, you can't imagine today testing a drug or a vaccine in secret. <laughs> and there's so much uh, oversight and control. And he didn't even tell any of the other senior scientists. So when he, he, he said that the crowning point for him in the entire polio saga was the day that he measured anti-polio antibodies in that first child. 
And he knew at that moment then that he could prevent polio. And uh, but he couldn't tell anybody except Basil O'Connor and and uh, his wife. <laughs> so he finally had to uh, divulge his results to the rest of the uh, this scientific uh, group, and they just went ballistic. I mean, they couldn't believe that he had done this. Not only that, Basil O'Connor wanted to test his trial in a very large trial, almost a million children nationally, and they were all opposed to that. Uh, with the exception of maybe one or two. Um, so Basil O'Connor, uh, who uh, wanted desperately to stop polio, as, as did Jonas Salk, uh, just disbanded uh, that group of scientists and appointed another group, uh, public health officials all, who wanted to do a trial. And so um, in 1954, the trial of uh, Salk's polio vaccine was not only funded, but carried out uh, by the public uh, through the March of Dimes. And in 1955, when the analysis was done, it had proved effective and could prevent polio. So from a scientist, uh, a, a young junior scientist, a medical researcher, went, uh, he went from that to almost an instant celebrity uh, or a hero. And uh, that was a major change in his life, I guess. <laughs> it certainly was. So uh, I should backtrack and say when I started uh, this biography, I didn't know a whole lot about Salk, uh, except that he had been kind of the hero of my generation. And one of the things uh, that uh, surprised me is on April 12, 1955, when he became this overnight hero, his life changed forever. And he suffered a great deal of pain from his from his fame. He, uh, within the first month after its announcement, he and the University of Pittsburgh on his behalf received 10,000 letters and gifts and telegrams. He, he couldn't walk into a hotel or a movie theater or a restaurant uh, without causing a stir, like a movie star. Everybody wanted to shake his hand and, and thank him. And then he began to note the, the downside of, of fame and the there were obsessives and con artists, and uh, his paper, his picture was on the paper of every single major newspaper, magazine, and even on a postage stamp. So he, this man who actually was was fairly shy, he was an introvert, suddenly had everybody wanting to know about him and and wanting to see him and wanting to touch this this great uh, hero, um, and, and that put him at odds with the scientific community. So it was a very painful thing for him. Mm -hmm. Now, why was his peer? Why were his peers or a broader scientific community was not as fond of him or his uh, achievement yeah. because it was a distinct achievement? What was their uh, kind of uh, or, or reasons uh, of disagreement? So that really actually was another major surprise uh, for me <laughs> when I started doing the research. So. On the day of the announcement at uh, the University of Michigan, um, there were 150 journalists there. It, it was a scientific presentation, but in fact, it really turned into almost a, a media frenzy and uh, enormous outpouring from from the public. And so it didn't it didn't sit well with the senior scientists. I mean, this wasn't the way you made an announcement about a a, uh, a research paper or a research uh, finding. But really what underlay all this, I think, is that Salk was a relatively young man at the time. He, he had barely turned 40. He was not a member of what I would call the, the scientific elite. He kind of stood on the, on the edge. But he had challenged and overturned a major, major tenet believed by virologists that only a live virus vaccine could produce lifelong protection against the disease. Uh, they seemingly never forgave him uh, for that. The second is that they accused him of grabbing the limelight. I mean, he had become this enormous celebrity and that he had failed to, to really notice or mention all the other people whose scientific work had paved the way for him, which wasn't really quite fair. He had tried to mention other names, but the public didn't want to hear about Dorothy Horseman or John Enders. You know, the, the media had made Jonas Salk the, 
the focus for the polio saga, and in doing so had, had turned him into this icon. So with his uh, vaccine came a wave of celebrity that really had been accorded few physician scientists in the history of medicine. Maybe Louis Pasteur was the was the only other one. And so you kind of can't discount uh, jealousy. Now, Salk wasn't totally uh, blameless in all of this. Uh, Salk uh, kept uh, much of his uh, work to himself. He kind of didn't play by the usual academic uh, rules. But probably even more difficult was that he reached out to the public as few physician scientists had ever done. The, the, the walls of academia were very high, and most of the public couldn't peek over them. <laughs> and uh, he reached out to the public. He, he had told his long-term secretary that he was beholden to the public through their dimes, through the March of Dimes. They had supported his research, and they had given up their children for these large clinical trials. And so uh, he tried to answer almost every single letter he got. He gave interviews to Good Housekeeping and Parenting Magazine. Now, no serious scientist did that. He went on television and showed the public how to make a vaccine with a wearing blender, which the scientific community just found ridiculous. And so he, he had this interesting relationship with the press, but most of them loved him. And uh, so he, he changed that relationship between the public and the scientific community and uh, and uh, they weren't ready for it. So it, it, it was very complex. It was, it, I spent years trying to uh, really comprehend that relationship between him and the scientific community. And it didn't just end with polio. It, every, everything that he worked on uh, seemed to have controversy in its wake. <laughs> so. so after the discovery of the vaccine, uh, how did the polio eradication uh, movement or process uh, progress in the United States and then in later on, I think, in a few years or decades later uh, around the world? Yeah, so he actually had been in, uh, he, he worked with other uh, physician scientists in other countries, particularly the Scandinavian countries. So uh, other work was going on uh, there as well. So within five years after the the release of the polio vaccine, paralytic polio was reduced by 90% in the United States. But the scientific community still believed that this was just a stopgap, that uh, this would work for a little while, but in order to get life term, lifelong immunity, you had to have a live virus vaccine. And Albert Sabin, uh, who many know in the, in the polio world, who was somewhat of a rival, actually, to uh, SALT, uh, came up with a live vaccine. It could be delivered in a sugar cube instead of requiring a shot. He tested it extensively in Russia and uh, 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 showed that it was effective and safe. And so the public health service recommended uh, that the SALT vaccine be replaced uh, by the Sabin vaccine in the early 60s, and they cited cost and convenience. And uh, most of the senior scientists uh, thought that was great, and practicing physicians thought it was great. It was real easy to give a sugar cube. Well, Salk was very disturbed. Um, he warned that uh, a vaccine made with a live virus could uh, mutate, and this weakened virus could become very virulent and actually might cause cases of polio. And he went up against all the major medical decision makers in the United States uh, trying to get that decision uh, reversed. But uh, really uh, ran up against a brick wall, so to speak. And um, in 1968, uh, his vaccine was no longer used in the United States. He really spent the rest of his life trying to reverse what he called a risky, politically driven decision, because what happened with time is uh, his prediction turned out to be true, that there were cases of polio from the vaccine. Uh, but by then, it was entrenched in the United States, and uh, the case numbers were small. And in fact, uh, when he died, the Sabin vaccine was the one still used in the United States. Four years after his death, however, it uh, was delicensed and replaced uh, with the Salk vaccine. Now, the polio story is the kind of, I call it the polio vaccine postscript, has actually been quite a wonderful story. Uh, the last case of polio in the United States was 1979, but there were uh, millions of, of cases uh, worldwide. And initially, 
the Sabin vaccine uh, was used in a lot of third world countries or, or developing countries, underdeveloped countries. And the salt vaccine was, was used in all the uh, developed uh, countries. The advantage, obviously, of the live vaccine in developing countries was the cost and the ease of administration. Because you're out in the, in the jungles, you can give a sugar cube. It's a lot easier than giving a shot. But the, the disadvantage was, of course, that the vaccine, the virus vaccine could mutate. And today, about a third of the cases worldwide of polio are from the vaccine itself. Now, much of the success in controlling polio can be attributed to Rotary International. In 1985, they launched their Polio Plus program, and they vaccinated 2.5 billion children in 22 countries over the years. In 1988, uh, the Global Polio Eradication Initiative uh, commenced, and that in had Rotary, World Health Organization, United Nations, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in the U.S., and finally the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And um, interesting, in 1988, when this started, there were a thousand cases of polio reported daily. That's that's astronomical. A thousand cases a day throughout the world. And despite uh, target killings of healthcare workers. Problems, uh, particularly in Afghanistan and Pakistan, last year there were only 106 cases worldwide. That's gone from 1,000 a day to 106 worldwide. The Global Polio Eradication Initiative is going to phase out uh, the Sabin vaccine since that's the cause of, of many of the cases and eventually revert totally to uh, a new uh, device to Salk vaccine, and their prediction is by 2019, polio will be eradicated from the earth. So it's a it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, end uh, to what he uh, what he started back in 19 in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. uh, when did uh, uh, Dr. Jonathan Salk pass away? Yeah, Jonas Salk died in uh, 1995. Um, he died at the age of 80 and uh, presumably died of uh, congestive uh, heart failure um, in San Diego. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And after the discovery and uh, and getting the notoriety, and of course uh, having the support of Basil O'Connor, that led to the birth of uh, the Institute in San Diego, the Hoya area. And uh, if you can explain under what circumstances, because they, were, they obviously were well financed and they were able to attract a lot of capital and very good people, well-qualified people, but there was still a little controversy of the people working. <laughs> there was not much respect given to him. So at the time um, in the around the world, there most of the institutes like the Pasteur Institute, uh, the Rockefeller, uh, were all scientists. And one of Salk's major concerns had always been that that science really needed the humanities embedded in them. Uh, to bring kind of consciousness to science, and obviously concerned about nuclear proliferation and the atomic bomb and some of the other uh, major developments in science that uh, could be very disastrous for humanity. So when he created the the uh, institute, the Salk Institute, he, he didn't name it the Salk Institute, by the way, uh, they did, but uh, he wanted to have scientists and humanists work side by side. Uh, as he said, infusing the science with the conscience of man. That, that was his goal, which was uh, really quite unique at the time. And he was able to get uh, Basil O'Connor, um, who, uh, again, the powerful director of the National Foundation or the March of Dimes, uh, to put the funding in uh, to develop this. And he looked at many different sites, but he chose uh, La Jolla, California, and built this magnificent uh, institute that sits, uh, looks over the Pacific Ocean. And there he was able to attract among the most uh, established senior prize-winning uh, scientists and, and humanists because he gave them funding for life and gave them total autonomy. And so it was just the, a, a wonderful concept, but it, it turned out to be somewhat of a heartache for Salk. Uh, he had uh, one of the world-famous uh, architects, uh, Louis Kahn, uh, 
design the institute, but Khan was a little bit of a maverick architect and was always behind schedule, and they uh, were always teetering on, on the edge of bankruptcy. And um, and the senior scientists, uh, with time, uh, began to uh, not treat Salk very well. Uh, they uh, thought his uh, his science was his scientific work was a, a little bit out of step with modern times. Uh, they thought this dream of, of putting the humanities together wasn't really uh, very practical. And uh, in fact, the later president of the institute said he could really raise more money with Salk uh, dead than alive. And so in the very end, uh, science dominated the institute uh, with really just a little thread of, of humanity. So that was the most heartbreaking for him, this great idea of, of melding the sciences and humanities in, in reality never came to pass. Uh, but it is uh, one of the world's most esteemed scientific institutes. Uh, and for that, uh, uh, he should have been uh, proud uh, rather than just saddened. And, and while he was there, he did return to his laboratory. He did work in cancer, uh, which really didn't amount to much. Uh, he did work on a therapy for multiple sclerosis, uh, which actually looked uh, promising, uh, but eventually patients developed severe allergic reactions and he had to uh, stop that uh, trial. And so the scientists there, uh, kind of mocking a little bit his scientific work, um, really connived to try to close down his laboratory. So it was it was a sad time uh, in his life. Yeah, and uh, not many people know about uh, other uh, after the uh, polio discovery, he was engaged also in the HIV virus and, as you mentioned, the multiple sclerosis virus. Uh, what were the uh, activities he was engaged in in the professional sense uh, after the, the after the he became well? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, he was doing multiple things at the same time. Uh, I have to say, after the, <clears throat> yeah, the influenza, uh, which he had co-developed a vaccine uh, very early in his life, he uh, kind of had a a campaign to try to uh, make influenza vaccine recommended or required for everyone over the age of six months because he was afraid that there would be a major influenza pandemic. Uh, And so he was constantly uh, doing that. He was constantly campaigning to improve the health of children worldwide. He never gave up his campaign uh, to try to uh, get uh, the killed vaccine reinstated and this uh, live virus vaccine uh, delicensed. So all those things were going on in the background. Uh, in multiple sclerosis, it was actually a therapeutic, uh, uh, almost a desensitization of this terrible kind of inflammatory or immune response that is responsible for multiple sclerosis. But he was through, his laboratory was closed and he was really playing the role of made kind of a, a senior advisor, um, which he, he really didn't like that much. He he preferred to be a hands-on person. Um, when the uh, HIV uh, suddenly reared its ugly head and he saw all these thousands of young men dying of this mysterious uh, disease, uh, finally called AIDS. And while most of the scientists were busy trying to understand how the HIV, the virus, actually attacks the immune system and causes this disease, uh, before they ever thought of any therapy or any vaccine, Falk just couldn't stand the fact that thousands and thousands would die every year that they procrastinated in doing anything. And he uh, helped co-found uh, with a young man named Kevin Kimberlin a trial called, I mean, a um, company called Immune Response. And he developed his own vaccine, a treatment vaccine that was supposed to, it wouldn't prevent uh AIDS, but it would delay the time between the infection with the virus and the development of full-blown AIDS. So the goal would be that people could live long lives, even though the virus had never been totally eradicated. And when he began testing it and began talking about it, the reaction in the scientific community was very mixed because he'd appear at these big international meetings. He was now uh, in his 70s. And here were all these, you know, young hotshot molecular biologists who were working on HIV, and 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 here comes Jonas Salk, kind of in his 
armor riding his steed into the, into the arena, and they didn't know what to make of him. Uh, and some of them uh, actually jeered uh, a little bit. Um, others, such as Robert Gallo, who actually uh, was one of the people that discovered the HIV virus, thought that it was really a noble effort. And so he was working uh, to test this vaccine. Of course, the time uh, this kind of trial would have to go on for 10 to 20 years if you're trying to delay the time between the infection and actually dying from uh, from uh, HIV. And so he was uh, measuring uh, what happened to their immune response, what happened to the amount of virus in their system, and it looked very promising. And then he hit a roadblock with the FDA. Now he couldn't do things in 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 the secret anymore and move ahead. There are lots of layers of bureaucracy. And he was kind of in contesting with the FDA about starting a large national trial when he suddenly died. And um, eventually his uh, therapeutic vaccine never got its, its due, so to speak. So he was amazing. I mean, he was working until the day he died. He never stopped working. He never stopped caring about the health of the public uh, and, and trying to improve it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that was the professional life or the professional career of uh, John Salk. Uh, what about his personal life? Because there's, it was a little bit uneven. Yeah, <laughs> that's a nice description. So Jonas' work really defined him, and that left very little time for his for his family or for any other uh, pursuits. And uh, so his his he had three sons, and uh, he was married to. Uh, a wonderful woman, uh, Donna Salk, who was a, a psychiatric social worker. But his uh, sons were in their, when they hit their teen years, they were sent east to boarding schools. They had very much interaction with their father, and and uh, his wife, uh, he really saw his wife. He was in the laboratory all the time or traveling. And uh, their marriage eventually uh, fell apart when he developed, had so much fame. She was a shy introvert uh, as well, and she could never accommodate to the celebrity that followed in the wake. I mean, because here he was a celebrity, but uh, his family uh, became celebrities by association. I, I remember Peter Salk, uh, his oldest son, told me, you know, he was, he was a, a small, kind of shy boy, but whenever he played, uh, for example, Little League, if he got up to bat, everyone assumed that he would hit a home run because he was Jonas Salk's son, and everyone expected he'd be brilliant in school and everything he did because he was Jonas Salk's son. So the family paid paid a high price, um, and he probably didn't protect them as much as much as he should. So that marriage ended in divorce, and several years later, he met and married a French artist, Francois Gillot. Um, and she was a very accomplished uh, French artist. She had was well known to the public because she had written a, a book, a very popular book called uh, My Life with Picasso, in which she uh, detailed her life as Picasso's mistress. Now, when Salt announced that, it, and, and he just was smitten and, uh, you know, followed her around and she finally agreed to to get married. His friends were shocked. I mean, she was much younger than him. She was a beautiful French artist, Picasso's former mistress, and they were they were just surprised. They were equally surprised when they heard about some of her provisos, such as uh, uh, she could spend six months out of the year in uh, France uh, painting. But they all had to agree that Salk had never looked happier and healthier uh, than when he was with Francoise. But as as time went on, she spent less and less time in, in San Diego. She did did not care for it, and um, their relationship almost seemed more intellectual than than emotional. And he uh, sought out uh, other women and had uh, a number a number of affairs, mainly because he was he was lonely and he was kind of seeking a soulmate. And so when he died, he actually, none of his family was even, was there. It happened quickly. So he really gave himself to the public. He gave himself to the world and uh, at, at, a, at a personal cost. Mm -hmm. And at a cost to his family as well. Yes, and a cost to his family as well. Mm -hmm. Well, 
you have done a wonderful job in detailing and, and, and compiling and then putting it together in a very engaging manner. And obviously, uh, this was your second book, uh, this a uh, uh, second biography as well. Uh, yes. And what was the first book about? So the first book, uh, the name of it was Henry Kaplan and the Story of Hodgkin's Disease. Um, Henry Kaplan is probably one of the uh, most famed uh, physician scientists in the cancer world, but he's not kind of a household name. And he developed the first linear accelerator, the radiation machine, uh, the, the basis of which we cancers treated today. And so was responsible, obviously, for the cure of millions and millions of people over time. Uh, but one of his special cancers that he worked on was Hodgkin's disease, which is a uh, cancer of lymph glands, uh, lymphoma that predominantly affects young people. And uh, it's a disease or a cancer that's uh, highly, highly curable today in, in excess of 90%. And that is because of his work and that of his colleagues. He was at Stanford, so I had known him, although he was deceased at the time I decided to write his biography. Uh, he was fascinating because he was such a multi-dimensional man who was kind of loved by some and called a son of a bitch by others. So he was he was really uh, quite controversial. Uh, he was uh, uh, really uh, got engaged in um, in a lot of, uh, of humanity work. He, for example, in, in Argentina in the 70s during the Dirty War, when lots of scientists were just disappearing, he put his own life at risk and went to Argentina to try to find them. So he, he was absolutely uh, fascinating. And uh, the book also intertwines the, the story of, of cancer and, the, and, the, uh, and its treatment. So that was my first biography. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, tell, tell our audience a little bit more about uh, Charlotte Jacob. You obviously were a emeritus professor of medicine at Stanford, uh, but how did you get involved in cancer and, and then further on in writing books? Well, um, I grew up in a small town in uh, East Tennessee in the Appalachian region. And uh, my early heroes uh, when I was very young were Edward Jenner of smallpox fame and uh, Louis Pasteur. And so I always kind of wanted to be a doctor <laughs> from the time I was little, but in the time when I was growing up, there were, uh, were very few women in medicine, and that wasn't uh, really uh, a very acceptable uh, path. But I, I didn't give up on that and eventually uh, became a medical oncologist, and I take care of patients with cancer and uh, did cancer research throughout my career at Stanford University in California. So that's been my predominant career, and uh, now toward the end of my career as a physician, I take care of veterans with cancer. That's my specialty, and I love that. I love working with veterans. When I was a child, of course, we didn't have television, and there was one movie house in town, but my prized possession was my library card, and uh, my father would take us to the library on Friday nights, and I always gravitated toward reading biography, and there were a whole series of childhood uh, biographies, and anyone that grew up in that era would no notice them as the orange-covered biography books that were written for uh, elementary-age children. And I just was uh, fascinated, uh, as I think most people that read uh, biography are interested in other people's lives and how people succeed, fail, make choices, uh, deal with crisis. And uh, so I always loved biography, but I never uh, viewed myself as a writer. When I was on sabbatical uh, at Stanford, I took creative writing course just for fun and realized I loved it. And so I started a tutorial with a Ehud Havazelet, who uh, was a creative writer, but who tutored me in biography writing. And so while I was continuing my academic career and being a physician, I uh, started writing, and I loved it. <laughs> I got hooked. <laughs> what were surprises when you were going through this uh, wonderful research that you were doing? And, and, and writing a book is not a simple thing, uh, especially with a man for, a, for two different uh, subjects that you dealt with. Uh, 
Would you explain what went through in putting the book together? What did you have to go through it in working with publishers and working with editors and doing a lot of research in collecting information and then distilling it down to something whether it's really good or not and deciding whether to put it in the book or not? Biography writing isn't for the <laughs> isn't for the uh, person who wants to get a book done quickly. That's for sure. Uh, my uh, first biography took me about 20 years, but I was developing my medical academic career at the same time and raising children. And the Salk uh, biography took me about 10 years. So I'll just use the Salk uh, as an example. Um, I kind of break it into three phases. One is the investigation and then the interpretation and then the presentation. Those are the three things as a biographer I dealt with. So the investigation I kind of think is like sleuthing. I, I called it my seeking sulk. Uh, and uh, in that regard, I reviewed his, he had extensive archives. He, he kept every single letter that came and went. Um, at the University of California, San Diego is where they're housed. And I went through the March of Dimes archives um, in uh, New York and uh, and just read them to learn all about him. And, and uh, actually his letters were probably the most uh, revealing about him. Um, I sought and, and found yearbooks and grade cards and diaries. I, I read his favorite books. I, I uh, looked at all the pictures I could find of him, particularly at the March of Dimes archives. I viewed videotapes of his interviews and his talks and, and kind of saw how he changed uh, throughout his, his life. And uh, probably the most fun and, and where I got a tremendous amount of, of anecdotes and insights was I interviewed over 100 people, uh, back from his family to um people he went to high school. I found 10 of his high school classmates uh, still alive and willing to uh, be interviewed. Medical school, people from all the, the different career paths that he was involved in, all the way to the doctor who witnessed his death. And so that that uh, was, was quite wonderful. And in that, I was fortunate that there were people that were willing to, to talk to me. And then the next I have this huge amount of information, I mean, including all the papers he wrote, all the papers written about polio by other scientists, and meetings, minutes from all the meetings he ever attended. So that was I had an enormous amount of information. And now I had to kind of put it all together. I, I almost felt like someone had put this huge mass of clay on my desk and said, you know, sculpt the perfect likeness of Jonas Salk. And so really kind of the hardest thing uh, besides how you're going to, to uh, put the whole book together was I, I had to say to myself, who, who was Jonas Salk? I mean, that, that's the underlying thing. It's, it's about him. What was his emotional, his intellectual, his spiritual makeup? How did it evolve with time? How did it affect his relationships, his career? How did it alter uh, history? So on the one hand, I I really have to know who this man is and I have to take take a stand. And uh, on the other hand, I have to take all of the events of his life and, and put it into some kind of, of narrative. So that's the third part, and that's the presentation. And uh, as my uh, wonderful uh, editor, Timothy Bent at Oxford University Press said, for a book to succeed, it has to touch people. Writing a biography isn't just a chronicle or a list of events in, in someone's life. It really has to show the growth and change in, in the main character. It really has to kind of pull out his vital spark. But also in writing it, I, I always kept in mind that uh, readers don't want to read about a spotless hero. <laughs> That's no fun. Uh, they really want to know the real person. They want to know his foibles, his mistakes, the obstacles he, he faced, uh, or she, if it were a woman I were writing about. And uh, so uh, it's quite complex and it's constantly changing because I would be you know halfway through the biography and find out some major aspect of his life that just I unearthed in, in doing an interview and then have to go back and, and reshape so it's really uh, quite an undertaking um, now I didn't in my um, first book Henry Kaplan I had a a wonderful, wonderful agent, uh, Robert Lesher, who was one of the old-time great agents in New York City. So I was very, very fortunate. 
and he was uh, working with me on the Salk when he unfortunately uh, died. And uh, I subsequently, one of my friends, uh, Abraham Gaze, who wrote Cutting for Stone, he's a very popular <laughs> author, who is at Stanford, uh, recommended me to his his agent, Mary Evans, who told me that unfortunately she really wasn't adding any more clients, but she had a new agent uh, who had joined her, Rachel Vogel. Uh, now, Rachel Vogel is uh, about the age of my youngest son. <laughs> and and uh, so she turned out to be absolutely incredible. Uh, she had so much insight. She helped direct my book to get uh, offers from uh, uh, multiple uh, publishers, uh, one of whom was Timothy Bent at Oxford University Press. And when I interviewed the, the different uh, editors, which in itself was quite amazing to me, uh, Timothy Bent understood what the book was all about. He knew what I was trying to do, and it was clear that he was the person with whom I wanted to work. And and I didn't look for a, um, a publisher until the book was really uh, near finished uh, because I didn't want that pressure that I had to turn the book in in a year and I was still far away from finishing. <laughs> um, so the whole process is quite fascinating and uh, and it's, it's really a team in the end that helps, not just the writer themselves. So I'm very fortunate. I'm very fortunate to have Rachel Vogel. I'm very fortunate to have worked with Tim Bent and his team. So writing a book is is, is in addition to other duties you have. Do you uh, uh, spend most of the time in California, or you're based somewhere else now, or? No, I spend as much time as possible in California. We, uh, my husband and I, uh, live on the Stanford campus. Uh, we have five sons. Uh, fortunately, they're all grown, <laughs> so we're not. Uh, Spending to children uh, now, and I spend half my time uh, taking care of veterans and half my time writing, and it's a kind of a perfect distillation of, of two things that I love to do. And uh, another key to to success is uh, having a spouse who is highly supportive in every way, and so I have to attribute a lot of it to my my wonderful husband Rod. Are there any other topics or uh, potential book topics that could interest you or fi- you may find fascinating? Well, uh, it, it, the problem is finding too much fascinating. <laughs> After I finished my uh, Henry Kaplan book, I spent a year trying to decide uh, what would be the next biography because uh, you know, spending 10 years on a biography is a big chunk of life, and, and that person kind of lives in your household for 10 years <laughs> and, uh, or more. And so I actually had uh, a long uh, list of uh, people and uh, stories with, that I wanted uh, uh, to tell. Um, and so I have not uh, yet settled uh, on uh, my next biography. There are several women who've made major strides in uh, genetics that, uh, that fascinate me, but uh, I haven't come to a final conclusion. And, uh, of course, then you have to have the person or if they're deceased, their family uh, and access to their to their archives to be able to, to write a biography. Thank you. Uh, we have been speaking with Charlotte Jacobs, the author of Jonas Saul, A Life. Thank you very much for your time and your comments. And uh, please let us know if you do end up writing another book. We would certainly like to hear about that again in the future. Thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure. You're welcome. Thank you.